there were Muslims who executed Croats and Serbs. There were Croats who ex executed Muslims and Serbs. The level of technical sophistication that the Iraqi insurgents achieved superseded 30 years of insurgency in Northern Ireland. And you'll go down there with your snips and, uh, and basically, you know, take your balls in your hand. And on my side, there were just bullets coming through. One went through the side of my helmet. Handed it to the gunners, you know, shell by shell. Yes, Chris, sorry, we were saying, uh, Sandhurst, when you join the Marines, you just join the Marines. And we, I think the, the unique thing about the Marines is both the officers and men do their training at the same establishment. Of course, in the Army, we have the, is it famous or infamous Sandhurst? That's right, um, yeah, a bit of, bit of each, yeah. I mean, obviously, because the Army is a bigger organisation, um, you need a, uh, a gargantuan site if you were to train everybody together anyway, you know, um, in the same way that the Royal Marines do. But um, the, the way Sandhurst works, I mean, I was slightly different because I spent a few years in the ranks first anyway. But um, you either go in as a direct entrant, so you're doing a three and a half day pre-selection, if you like, and then you go and do your 12 months at Sandhurst. Um, you do what I did, which was an ex-ranker, where you spend a couple of years as a non-commissioned officer. Um, so in my case, I sort of reached my ceiling at Lance Corporal. So uh Sanders was the only way ahead after that if I wanted to carry on a career. And then, um, or you could go right the way through the ranks, which we call a late entry commission. And those guys just do a couple of weeks, obviously, because they don't need to, to do much longer. There's not much they need to be trained in. But in terms of when you get there, you're sponsored by a, uh, um, a corps, uh, you know, one of the regiments or, or the corps, if you like. Um, and then as you get through to the second term, once they sort of get to, you know, give you a better idea. So there's three terms in total. Um, then they decide whether or not they definitely want to take you. Um, and the idea is that when you get to the end of your final term, you're then that's you selected and you go and join your uh, your regiment or your corps. But obviously, in some cases, um, there's been in the uh, in the news this week, a, uh, a young lady who's been um, successfully um, sponsored by the parachute regiment. She'll be the first ever female officer to join the parachute regiment. But um, even in those cases, you know, if you don't sort of come up to the uh, required standard, then basically you've got to uh, to go to another regiment anyway if they'll take you. So in her case, she would have to pass P Company um, to uh, to stay on at the parachute regiment. And certainly when I joined up, there were a couple of guys joined, um, went through Sanders through the twelve months, fit guys, capable guys, and uh, and they didn't have the required sort of metal to uh, um, to go on and serve at the parachute regiment. They didn't pass P Company, so they had to go and join another another regiment. So she's. It's almost as if she's got the hard part yet to come. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, you know, Sandest is, it's a unique place. Um, you know, what they've got to do, not dissimilar, of course, to the uh, to the Royal Marines um, selection and training and, and, and for the officers. You know, as you know, Chris, it's very, very hard to simulate the pressures of combat and conflict and warfare. And as an officer, as an NCO, as a leader, you know, you've got to be able to make decisions in those very, very demanding environments. And, you know, even with the military the way it is, you know, health and safety won't allow you to recreate those conditions, those environments um, realistically. You know, no one's ever going to be firing RPGs at you and putting heavy machine gun fire down on you and that sort of stuff. So the way they do it, of course, is sleep deprivation and, uh, and you know, maximum sort of mental um, pressure as well. So, you know, they make sure that you're physically beasted, um, you don't get a lot of sleep and then they give you a lot of, uh, you know, physical, uh, sorry, a lot of um, psychological and mental problems to uh, to solve as well. And and you, just to see what you like under pressure, because if you can't handle that, there's no way you're going to be able to handle it for real, is there, you know? And I'm just throwing this out there. Of course, you, you don't have to deal with loss, do you, in training? Well, unless there's a training accident, it, that's that's a whole another part of warfare that that you can't really recreate that's right i mean i think you know the, the the british armed forces now um has moved forward leaps and bounds in terms of dealing with um you know mental trauma post-traumatic stress disorder things like that and of course loss is a massive part of that um i think the uh you know the soldiers sailors airmen marines that have served in afghanistan and iraq in particular over the last couple of decades um there's not a single one that hasn't experienced that loss 
And even if you sort of experienced extreme pressure, extreme trauma, um, there are those people that have survived and get that survivor guilt as well. And it's very, very difficult, you know. Um, there are certain um, specializations, certainly with the UK Special Forces, with bomb disposal, you do psychometric testing, psychiatric evaluations. And those to a degree can identify if you've got a, a predisposition, if you like, towards dealing with stress and pressure. But I think it's something that you, you know, you know better than anybody. You learn as you go along. You're with us, some of our experiences, aren't we? And, uh, you know, I certainly, when I was a young young officer in the Balkans in uh, in the uh, the early 90s, um, I witnessed some things that were pretty grim, but I got post-traumatic stress disorder from it. Um, obviously, you know, as we all do, you never get over it fully, but you learn to deal with it. You learn to accept it. You learn to rationalise it and you move on and you become more resilient as you go through. And the things I witnessed later in my career were far, far more traumatic. But of course, you know, we've built up our maturity, our experience, our resilience. And so it's much, much easier to, uh, to deal with. And it certainly affects you less, I think, later on in life. Mm. Is Sandhurst a set programme? Because for, for the career you're going into, it's obviously you're quite independent, aren't you? You're not having to deal with 30 men on a, on a battlefield. It's very very specialist i think in the same way that as a as an enlisted soldier you're a soldier first and a you know tradesman second for example if you you know you join one of the corps it's exactly the same with the officer corps and whether that's the royal marines whether it's the royal navy the royal air force even um, and the army you know the idea is that uh, with the army you're a soldier first so every officer is trained effectively as an infantry officer and the program is exactly the same it's 12 months and you start off effectively with, you know, basic training, if you like, for the first uh, the first term, the first three and a half months. Then it goes into the, uh, you know, the more military and leadership type training. And then the final term is the sort of, you know, the more specialist stuff, a lot of counterinsurgency, um, you know, the nuances, if you like, that you're going to see in uh, in military service and, uh, and conflict. So, um, yeah, it prepares you for it. And then depending on who you join, you go off and do your your sort of special to arm training after that, you know, in the case of officers, they're young officers training. And in the case of being a bomb tech and an ammunition technical officer like myself, you know, your training never really stops. It takes six years to become a, a high threat operator, you know, including your sort of military training, your basic training. Um, and I think it's the same with, you know, any organization and certainly the Royal Marines included, you know, every day's a, a school day, isn't it? You never, ever stop learning. You constantly, uh, you know, and even if you get skill fade, you're still trying to sort of, you know, revise and, uh, and and reacquaint yourself with your skills, aren't you? Yes, I would say you probably stop learning when you leave the job. But even then, I'm I'm learning, probably learning stuff now, aren't I? Of all these people, I wonderful people I get to to speak to. Well, and all the wonderful experiences you've had, you know, I mean, all the things you've done, um, you know, <laughs> since leaving the military, um, it's phenomenal, isn't it? I was going to say you could write a book about it, but you have, obviously. So there we go. Yeah. Don't make me write another one. I've written <laughs> six already, I think. Yeah. Mad, mad. Well, I'll take my hat off to you. It's a uh, it's hard graft as well, isn't it? It's a uh, it's, it's hard to dig deep and, uh, you know, have those dark nights of the soul when you're rewriting your uh, your memoirs. Yes. Well, as you know, you've got several books out out as well we'll come on and talk about them i think for me the um is your mental health is everything how, how you are in this moment right now that that's all it's about i i are you balanced are you happy are you, are you achieving or are you in the sort of deficit and uh yes ma massive area of of um I think I learn more every two weeks now that goes by than I did in the previous six months and certainly in, you know, in, in, in the previous years. That's the massive achievement in itself, isn't it? You know? And uh, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you. People sort of talk about, you know, once they go down the wrong road, um, that's it, you know, but the point is, you know, you take a wrong turn then you turn back, don't you? And uh, you know, we all have a chapter of our lives. I think that we, we don't want to sort of read out aloud, but you can always rewrite your history. You always rewrite your future can't you you can't rewrite your history so yeah, yeah you reflect i suppose you you learn to interpret it don't you and make 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 sense of it and use it to the positive and i guess the guys that don't make it through this awful suicide wave that we we've, we've seen uh you get hung up some somewhere in that process and it it's a it's a shame, isn't it? We are just a product of our thoughts. Yeah. And 
the right person maybe saying the right thing at the right time could just be a game changer yeah something that you connect with exactly mm. yeah it's 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 incredible how you know when i talk about fear and danger and people always associate you know for some reason bomb disposal as you know um being able to overcome your your fears and there's a degree of that but it's quite interesting how you know danger is real isn't it it's physical it's tangible but fear is just an emotion you know it's a it's a response to that potential danger and yet it's something that absolutely can cripple us can curtail every decision we make all our future and it's the same way of course you know it leads on to, to trauma and, and and certainly affects our mental health doesn't it and you know it is ultimately just a just emotions, but it's such a powerful, powerful um, part of our our success or our failure. I think our mental health and the way we think about things. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I think in your profession, a, a, a generous element of fear is probably a good. I mean, the opposite is being blasé, I suppose, and that's not not something that you want. Yeah, it's right. It's um, you know, certainly. Interestingly, the uh, the greatest number of deaths um, of bomb disposal operators when they're actually deployed in the field um, is, is usually complacency. You know, it's and it's almost always the very beginning of an operational tour when they're just sort of, you know, still getting their heads around what the uh, the threat environment is, if you like, mm. and the atmospherics. Um, or it's those last couple of weeks when when they start to just let their guard down a little bit. And I think it's the same across the sort of, you know, the spectrum of conflicts with all of the British Armed Forces, really, and, and the contractors that work in that environment afterwards as well. Mm. Um, it, it certainly does. But with when it comes to, to fear, you know, I've always, and my colleagues as well, always maintain that you need to have a healthy level of paranoia, but you've also got to, you know, rationalise that fear and look at what is danger, what is tangible, what is real, and, and what is just that sort of emotional product, if you like, that I could do something about. Um, and when you realise it's just an emotion, then of course you can overcome it and, uh, you know, find a route through. Did you face any sort of prejudice at Sandhurst, Chris, coming coming from the ranks? Uh, it was interesting. I mean, uh, Sandhurst is an unusual place because you've got foreign students there. You've got, you know, what we call the Guards and Cavalry Club, you know, the posh guys who, as it happens, are all absolute gentlemen and the real deal, you know. You've got those guys that are, try to want to be guards and cavalry if you like they're the difficult ones they're the tricky ones you know um as an ex-ranker and usually when you get there um you're still beasted the same way by the uh, the color sergeants and the direction staff but um you're normally assigned a foreign student to look after so you go through basic training but you're also sorting out someone else's basic training for them as well and doing all their bed blocks and making sure their boots are polished and you know you don't do it for them but you're certainly doing it with them you know so um you're given a little bit of leeway um, but when you mess up, of course, you're, uh, you know, usually uh, significantly more disciplined than, uh, than the others because you're expected to know better. But um, no, it's just, you know, it is what it is. It's um, it's ultimately, you know, any form of basic training is designed to break us down a bit, rebuild us and make sure, you know, we become team players and, uh, and team members. And in the case of officer training and, uh, you know, senior NCO training um, to make sure we're, uh, we're leaders as well. So, you know, it certainly wasn't too bad. It was when I think when I was in the uh, in the ranks, um, I was a, a lance corporal and decided to apply for you know to go to Sandhurst. I was worried then that um, you know everyone was going to assume that I thought I was better than everybody else. That wasn't my reason for doing it. You know, I had some really good officers, but I also had some really bad ones. And I thought, you know what, maybe I could go and do this and, uh, and do it a bit differently. Mm-hmm. And um, I was worried what my uh, what my colleagues, what my peers would think. You know. And it was amazing because they were so, so supportive. And then when I, you know, when, when I got my uh, my commission, um, you know, we're still lifelong friends. And in fact, most of them now, are, you know, commissioned or uh, or have left anyway, you know. So it is what it is, you know. It's just another route, isn't it? It's another, um, you know, another strand of our, of our service, of our careers, of our life story. Yes, it's much more relaxed now from when I have my contact with the Marines. Um, several of the guys I joined up with, went on to be majors, this sort of thing. A um, couple of weeks ago when we did our charity speed march, Colonel Gaz V cop popped along and, and supported us and he was from the ranks. Um, and back in my day, there's no way you'd call a Colonel mate, but, but now everything's, I don't know if the reality of war just has sort of, 
or whether it's just the nature that society's kind of changing in, in, in that respect? I, I honestly think it's the nature of conflict, definitely. You know, um, when I, I joined up in 1989 and, uh, you know, the, uh, the instructors, the directing staff, um, when I was, I was a young 16 year old, I joined as a, an army apprentice and, um, you know, even the, uh, the old sweats sort of had their Falklands medal, their uh, Northern Ireland medal, and, uh, you know, possibly some sort of gallantry medal or an MB or something like that. Mm. Um, when I went to Sandus, it was the same, you know, these super duper instructors um, had a couple of gongs. And then by the time I left in 2006, you know, you had young, young soldiers, sailors, Marines, um, with a chest full of ribbons on, you know, and the nature of conflict, there was so many different conflicts taking place. And I think that experience um, took us from a, um, an armed forces where some were super professional and certainly, you know, the, the parachute regiment, the Royal Marines, I would, you know, put into that ca category. There were others that weren't so, you know, some of the army, I'm sad to say, and the armed forces were very much a drinking club. Um, but over those years of different conflicts, I think it became a really professional, unified organisation. And I think certainly there was a, a much, much greater deal of respect between the ranks, across all ranks, and indeed across the, you know, all of the uh, the arms and services as well, because we all saw each other doing their jobs and we all relied on each other to do those jobs. So I think it made a big difference, definitely. Yeah. And also, well, like you say, you know, the... Uh, the nonsensical rules, the, uh, you know, what can I say bullshit on here? You know, what we call the, uh, the bullshit. Mm. I think that kind of was curtailed quite a lot as well. So, uh, yeah. And where did you go from Sandhurst? Um, from there I went to, uh, so I wanted to become an ammunition technical officer, um, bomb disposal operator. Um, you couldn't go straight in to do that. You had to join, they became the R Royal Logistic Corps, the really large corps, several different corps sort of subsumed into that. So I went there first, um and uh went to the pioneer regiment because that was the uh, the closest thing you could do to the infantry because you had to do a couple of years as a young officer first and then with them i went out to the balkans um went and did arctic warfare training in norway jungle warfare training in uh in kenya and then we did another tour in northern ireland um and that was fantastic you know having the same troop 45 blokes um for the entire period um you know we're still lifelong buddies to this day. In fact, many of them still call me boss to this day. You know, they've, they've been civvies for 20 years. Um, and then from there, I went off and did the ammunition technical officers course, which is our sort of the British Army's um, counter-terrorist bomb disposal operators, if you like. Uh, the Royal Navy have them, the Royal Air Force have them. Um, other members of the uh, the Army have them as well. But the uh, the ATOs and the ATs, they're the sort of counter-terrorist guys, the what I would call the specialists. So I went off and did the 14-month course um, for that. And then got posted to 11 EOD Regiment, um, went out and did my high threat tour. You had to do a sort of what we call a high threat tour during the day, which was Northern Ireland back in those days. Um, did a couple of tours out there and then um, got earmarked to go and work with the Special Forces. So I did a couple of years with the SAS, a couple of years with the SBS and then finished off working in intelligence. And over that period, did all the sort of war zones of the day, Iraq, Afghanistan, went out to Colombia and several other places as well. So it was a fascinating career, certainly. And, uh, and working with some amazing people, as you can imagine. Gosh. Because, I mean, you're, you're, you're an elite special force in yourself in that role. Um, well, we certainly, it's very kind of you, Chris. Yeah, we wouldn't consider ourselves that by any standard. But, you know, if, if you said to me when I was 16, right, to get to where you are, you're going to need to do this, 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 this. I'd, I'd have said, well, there's no way I could ever achieve that, you know. But as you know yourself, you sort of, you don't forest gump your way through, but you, you achieve each goal, don't you? And it seems hard at the time. And there are other people that big it up. There are other people that play it down. But when you get to there, you know, you just, you find a way, you overcome it, you deal with it, you achieve it. You move on to the next one, you move on to the next one. And then before you know it, you've had a career in it. It seems on paper, you know, that you've achieved quite a lot, but you know, as you know, well, we look at our colleagues, you know, and uh, mm. you know, there are, there's always someone else who's achieved a lot more and, I've certainly, I've, I'm not a competitive type of person, you know, it's not really in my nature, um, but the competition's always been with myself, you know, am I a better man than I was yesterday? If the answer is no, then I need to pull my socks up. If the answer is yes, then, you know, try and keep doing what I'm doing. But um, yeah, 
I've, um, I've made terrible, terrible mistakes in my life and things that I'm truly ashamed of and, uh, and done things that I'm, you know, I'm proud of as well. So that's real life stuff, isn't it? It's what we are. Yes. I guess the big difference, Chris, is if you're a soldier or a Marine or whatever and you're one of the lower ranks, you can kind of cruise on by with not maybe a massive interest in the job. You're just doing it to get paid and you can't wait to get home at the weekend. And certainly my last four years was a lot of guard duty and it really wouldn't, I mean, no one wants, <laughs> no one wants to do guard yeah. duty. You really just could not wait to get off that shift and get on your mountain bike or go to the pub or whatever it was. But in your role, in the special forces role, you're there because you're a professional and, and you have to be, there isn't there. You can't take, you can't, you know, muddle yeah. on through it. You can't take your foot off the accelerator. Can you? Yeah. It's, it's obviously it's a, it's a massive honor when you're invited to go and work with them. Um, you know, I went to the SAS to start with and they notoriously dislike Rupert, you know, they dislike officers. It's, it's not as bad as it's made out to be, but you know, the idea is that, you know, within the elite, within the parachute regiment, within the Marines, within their support networks, within the special forces, the guys know what they're doing. You know, they're super elite switched on soldiers. They can run the show themselves. You know, they've got tons of experience. And there's an argument, you know, they don't really need officers. Um, obviously, that's not the case. You know, the officers play a vital, vital function in many cases. Um, but when you go in as an attached arm, as an outsider, you know, it can be quite hard, especially if you're an officer. Um, so, you know, you've got to know, you've got to know your onions. And when I went to the SAS, it was good because I brought something to the party. It's the same with the doctors, you know, in the medical center, it's the same with the pilots from the air corps, you know, all the sort of specialist support arms, they all bring something to the party. And certainly you're expected to be at the top of your game, you know, for sure. And then of course, you know, if you, if you do okay, if you, uh, if you don't mess up, and they like you, then you're invited to stay within the uh, in the network, you know. So I then went and worked with the uh, the Royal Marines in the Special Boat Service, and um, you know that was an amazing experience again. And interestingly, you know, slightly different psyche as well, but equally as elite and professional. Um, and certainly, you know, um, you're very much once you've proved yourself and you show that you know what you're doing and you're bringing something to the party, then you're accepted as a as an equal. And it's um yeah, it's a great environment to belong to. Is there a in a nutshell, can you sum up the difference between the SAS and the Marines? Is there a certain? I've got to be careful what I say here, aren't I? Yeah, I think the um back then, uh, this is sort of early two thousands. I think the SAS were a lot more serious. You know, um, the Special Boat Service were a lot more chilled. They were both equally as professional. So you know. Does one work? Does the other one not work? They both worked. Um, but I think the SAS was more serious. The SBS were more chilled. They both got the job done really professionally, you know. Um, if you were to say to me, what's the difference between um, the special forces and the regular army and the regular armed forces? Um, I would say the one difference I noticed, you know, having been attached to them was resilience. You know, every single, the guys are all different. They're, it's a, they're a group of misfits that fit together. And it's very much the same in the Royal Marines, I know. You know, but the one thing that they've all got is that absolute drive, absolute mission focus, and this resilience where they just, you know, they will keep going when the chips are down. They don't give up. And I think, you know, that's something that when you're parachuted into that environment, then, you know, it's, a, it's very contagious. You know, it's very inspirational. It's very motivating. And it makes you a better better soldier yourself as well yes these guys um are in situations aren't they where you you're going in and you might not necessarily come out and everything you can do to up those odds by being the best you can be um it's gonna gonna be welcomed in, <laughs> welcomed in that kind of troop isn't it can you explain um the Balkans and what, what the British military's role was there? Yeah, absolutely. So the Balkans, and it was also known as the uh, the Bosnia War, um, it was in the early 90s. Um, basically, Yugoslavia had been a part of the Soviet Union, but had been independent. Um, and it was uh, controlled by uh, uh, General Tito. And 
you had all sorts of different sort of nationalities and cultures there that were basically um, controlled, inspired, motivated, brought together by this, you know, amazing leader. Um, and when he died, the place started to fragment and there were centuries old sort of issues and, uh, and, and conflicts that resurfaced. And suddenly there was a massive civil war and uh, there was ethnic cleansing, you know, genocide on a scale that we'd never seen before in history. And it was in Europe, effectively, you know, it was on our, on our, on our, on our sort of borders. So it really sort of shocked the world. So the United Nations sent a force in there as peacekeepers. It was a, a largely ineffective force. You know, they literally, in many cases, stood by and watched genocides take place. Um, I deployed there with the, uh, the British Army, but the entire armed forces deployed there in their various different roles. Um, and uh, I was very lucky to have extended my tour. And when the United Nations switched to NATO, when they actually, you know, had a uh, an offensive role, if you like, did something, peace enforcement, um, I got to stay there with my uh, my troop as well. So uh, we went from this sort of largely, you know, um, incapable force um, watching on the sidelines as these terrible things took place to then being able to actually do something about it and, uh, and you know, help to, to create peace as well. So um, I went to Sanders when I was 21, graduated at 22, went straight out to the Balkans as a young 22 year old troop commander. And uh, we all have those sort of those epiphany moments in our lives, don't we? That moment where you go from being a boy to a man. And I think that was, you know, for me, that was where I went away as a boy and came back as a man, you know, learned an awful lot about myself, about, you know, about humanity, about human nature. And it's interesting as well, because um, if you say to me, you know, what's the one thing you sort of take away from, from warfare and conflict and, and from a life in conflict, I think the one thing that I've taken away is that people are fundamentally good in warfare you see the very, very best in humanity and you see the very, very worst in humanity, of course. But what it does do is it reaffirms, I think, that people are fundamentally good. And, uh, you know, and I think that's what sort of keeps you going. And, and, and certainly what keeps people that are in the military, um, you know, what keeps them motivated. Because we talk about queen and country and that sort of stuff. You know, nobody really joins for queen and country. But I think a lot of people stay for it once they've experienced, you know, what we're all about, what we stand for. And, uh, you know the general level of decency, I think, of the uh, the British fighting man and woman. And eth ethnic cleansing, it's just, God, it's two words that just bring horrors into your mind, isn't it? Did you, were you, yeah. I mean, you might, obviously don't upset yourself, but did, can you give us an idea of the sort of things you have to witness in, in that theatre? Yeah, I mean, you basically, you know, in Srebrenica, um, which is one of the areas that uh, the United Nations was responsible for. You know, there was over a, a thousand, um, in fact, more, I can't even remember the exact number, but it, well over a thousand, excuse me, Muslims um, executed by, uh, by Serbs. There were Muslims who executed Croats and Serbs. There were Croats who ex executed Muslims and Serbs. And, you know, once it starts, once that chain of events starts and the retribution kicks in, um, you see people becoming very, very base. You know, they suddenly, the things that we would consider right and wrong as human beings are suddenly no longer quite as sort of uh, clear. You know, there's a very, very blurred area in between. And then some of them, as they start to commit those atrocities, it becomes almost normal. So, you know, you either met people, you know, you, you met an elderly couple and, you know, the wife would tell you what happened to her husband when he was taken prisoner as an OAP and what he was forced to do to another man's genitalia and things like that. And it's just like horrendous when you see these, you know, these two old dears basically. And, and then you see young people scarred for life. Um, you know, I've got friends nowadays who, you know, during one of the Kosovo, during the Kosovo war, she didn't see her family for six years. And eventually, you know, one of the brothers turned up, the parents turned up and one of the brothers was dead, you know, but living in a refugee camp, not knowing what's going on. And it's, it's, it's quite interesting when we're back in our own country, back in our own civilization, back in our own reality, as it's called nowadays. And you see people complaining about their lots. Um, and you think, yeah, of course, you know, you're right to feel some sort of injustice here. But it really isn't as bad. There's always someone better off. Uh, sorry, there's someone far, far worse off as well in, in this case. And, you know, in the case of these guys over in the Balkans, that was the first time I'd really experienced that. Just talking to everyday people who had witnessed horrendous things or experienced, you know, 
significant, significant loss. And uh, yeah, you'd be inhuman for it not to affect you for sure. What kind of jobs did you have to do over there? My particular job was uh, running the, uh, the the troop, so uh, 45 guys. And our main job was to look after the divisional supply area, so providing the security for it. And then we used to do the escorts of all the uh, artillery ammunition going up to Mount Igman, um, which was then used from the artillery points to fire down onto the uh, um, at the enemy positions or the combatant positions. And uh, basically, because those convoys were attractive targets, they used to get attacked. So my troop and I, we used to go along and uh, and provide the security for them and obviously engage anybody if uh, if necessary. And then when we got up to the, uh, the business end, you know, it was usually, you know, I remember one day in particular, there were Serbs shelling civilians in uh, in Sarajevo with tanks and artillery um, and snipers there shooting them. So uh, we were with the United Nations, sorry, with the with NATO at that point. And um, we got the call to, uh, you know, go and put down some fire on them. So we were basically unpacking all this ammunition and literally handing it to the gunners, you know, shell by shell. They were whacking it in the guns, firing it down on the enemy. And then there'd be a sort of a quick lull. And then a couple of F-16s would fly in and, uh, and mallet the, uh, the enemy positions as well. And, you know, it wasn't hard, hard soldiering by any means. We were very much, you know, facilitating, supporting. But it did make you feel good to be a part of something that was actually saving people's lives, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, you know, as a 22-year-old, you're actually still a kid. You know, you are. And, uh, you know, you feel all grown up and important. I'd been, you know, in the army for six years by that point. I'd done, you know basic training as a soldier experience as a soldier sanders training but you are still a baby really you know so it's uh it's interesting how it affects you could you see um um indicators of of ptsd then in 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 your men were were, were i'm i'm guess well i mean back when i served in belfast it was almost like we just hit it and we just kept hitting it. And w- we had a, um, a KIA very, very soon after we were there. And for me, it was just, okay, let's get, just get back on the street as soon as possible and can, can continue our, our, our role. And it wasn't till adult, oh, <laughs> I'm saying it now, adulthood. Yeah, we're grown ups. Yeah. <laughs> Want to become an old bastard that you get chatting with the guys and see how much, it can really has affected them their whole whole lives. Um, I'm just wondering if in in a more intense conflict like that, whether you could see. I mean, were people coming to you and saying, "Boss, I don't feel right about this"? Or it was with Bosnia. It was it was definitely afterwards. You know, um, I mean, I can talk about my uh, my first Iraq tour and that was totally different again you know that was right at the end of my career as well um and I was a lot more experienced and uh, you know and could see the signs as well um but it's interesting you know um Lord Moran who was Winston Churchill's physician during the war and you know Winston Churchill was famous for you know having the black dog as he called it his deep dark depression and Lord Moran talked about soldiers and fighting men having what he called the stock of courage, a sort of level of resilience that we all have. You know, you and I, Chris, could literally look identical physiologically. We could be identical in terms of our, you know, mental brain power, our IQ, our physical ability. Okay, but although we look and behave identically, one or the other of us could respond completely differently to trauma. And this is what Lord Moran talked about. And the idea was that, you know, you could be exposed to trauma, to stress, to, you know, massive drama, um, to fear, to terror, whatever it might be. And your levels of resilience start to deplete. What he calls your stock of courage starts to deplete. And the idea is that um, as it depletes and it gets to lower, lower levels, it starts to deplete more quickly as well to get to real danger levels, you know? And the idea is if you can extract someone from that environment, or change the environment, then you can allow those levels to replenish and you can get effectively strong again, you know. But if you don't recognise it and you stay there, it gets to the dangerously low levels and then basically it can become, you know, absolutely critical, okay? So I think he was absolutely right with that. You know, I I can completely relate to that. Um, And that's why I think, you know, our members of our armed forces nowadays, 
They have what they call trim training. They have people like, you know, specifically trained to identify the symptoms. And certainly when they come home from a, you know, from a, a conflict zone nowadays, they tend to do what they call decompression, where they all go, you know, they have some debriefing, have a few beers, um, you know, spend some time together recounting their, uh, their dits, their stories. And, uh, you know, that's all part of the, the healing process, I think. Mm. Um, what was quite interesting for me was uh, when I was in Iraq with um, my team, I had an eight man team doing a counter-terrorist bomb disposal out there in 2004. And literally four days into the tour, we were ambushed and it was quite rock and roll there. You know, the, the IRA were the world's leaders in making terrorist bombs up until that point. And the level of technical sophistication that they achieved over 30 years. And, you know, you know all about this because you were in Northern Ireland yourself during the Troubles. Mm. Um, you know, they were really, really good at what they did. You know, horrendous, evil rascals, but very, very good at what they did. And within 18 months of the insurgency in Iraq taking place, the level of technical sophistication that the Iraqi insurgents achieved superseded 30 years of insurgency in Northern Ireland. Um, you know, that's a rapid, rapid rate of, uh, of advancement. So, you know, we were basically, uh, I wouldn't say we were caught off guard, but it was quite cheeky. There was quite a lot to deal with, quite a lot to take on board. And we certainly, you know, as the world's leading counterinsurgency force, the British Armed Forces, we couldn't go in there resting on our laurels. You know, we had to literally um, be prepared to pull our socks up and, uh, and start learning again, you know, not become complacent. And four days into it, you know, we'd been doing... Um, several, I think we did three devices, three IEDs that day as a team. And it's quite, you know, it's quite tiring as well. 50 degrees Celsius in the midday sun. And we're driving back about 11 o'clock at night and we were ambushed. Um, you know, eight of us in, uh, in three vehicles. Um, and, uh, you know, it's horrendous. An ambush is designed to kill everybody. And it was rocket propelled grenades. It was medium machine guns. It was Kalishnikovs. It was hand grenades, you know. Um, about 45 insurgents, it was estimated, at the side of the road. And it was terrifying. You know, I got shot in the leg. Um, my, uh, my number two, who was driving, got shot in his shoulder. Uh, so number two, by the way, is the bomb disposal um, number two in the team. Um, and then, uh, you know, other guys were, were, were injured as well. Um, but we managed to get out of it all alive. Um, and the next day, we had to, uh, to drive back into the... Um, um, along the same route that we got ambushed. It was the only possible route to get to the, this device. And that was quite cheeky. And interestingly, um, when we got back, because I'd sort of witnessed PTSD before, experienced it myself, seen it in other, uh, uh, other soldiers, um, this was back in 2004. It was no longer a taboo, but there wasn't really the sort of... Uh, um, the, not the procedures, the uh, the interventions in place, if you like, um, on a large scale. So I contacted the the theatre psychiatric nurse in uh, in Iraq, and I said to all the boys, "I'm going to order you." And it's probably the only time I've ever ordered anyone to do anything in my life, actually, as an officer. I'm going to order you all to sit down, and uh, we're going to have a sort of big group hug, a big group therapy session, and talk about this ambush. And then each of us, I'm ordering you all to have a 30 minute session with the. Uh, um, the theatre psychiatric nurse, you know, the, uh, the the shrink, the trick cyclist. And that really, really worked well. You know, it gave everyone a chance to actually, you know, unload, um, to talk about it, to put it into perspective. And most importantly, to, to realise that what they were experiencing, you know, was normal. It was, you know, he gave some examples and he talked about, you know, he said, you know, did you feel this overwhelming, paralysing fear? Did you feel the, you know, you couldn't think straight? You know, were you scared? You know, yada, 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 yada. And he went through all these sort of symptoms and we sort of all tick, 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 tick. And he was like, right, pretty much since the First World War, that is the experience of every single soldier in this particular type of uh, um, contact, this type of conflict, you know, in an ambush. And it made you realise that, you know, it's a, a normal response to an abnormal situation, you know. And that, I think that helped, helped a lot. Um, and of course, nowadays, you know, it's uh, it's part of the course for, for our soldiers when they're out on the ground. If there's a conflict um, or something particularly cheeky, then, you know, they tend to get some sort of uh, support uh, usually. How's he getting shot in the leg about that's painful? I, I've got to tell you, it's it's the best sort of granddad war wound you could ever, <laughs> ever hope for. Um, <laughs> I remember at the time 
So we were driving, the bomb disposal vehicles were German. So they were left-hand drive. So um, I was sitting on the right-hand side. The driver, my number two, was on the left-hand side, um, Dan. And uh, I remember, they had, do you remember in Northern Ireland, you had the grills down the front of the, uh, the vehicles to stop bricks and stuff being thrown through. So we had these grills down the, uh, the side windows of the cab and the front, which are absolutely no use to, to anybody, really, in that sort of environment. They were completely unarmoured, and it was an IED threat, improvised explosive device threat. So, you know, they weren't in any way bomb-proof. Um, and uh, just remember all these bullets whizzing through the uh, the window. It was a you know a ambush from the right flank. And I remember turning to uh, to Dan, my number two, and he's driving like this, one-handed, with his hand on his shoulder. And I'm thinking, you know, this guy's as cool as a cucumber here. It turned out that a, a grenade had um, detonated on the on his side of the vehicle, and a fragment had gone into his shoulder. So that's why he was holding it. And on my side, there were just bullets coming through. One went through the side of my helmet. Um, the other one went through um, a, a sort of gap in my trousers, if you like. And then as we were driving along, I had to turn and place a bum cheek on the dashboard um, in order to fire out of the, uh, the right hand side of the vehicle because um, I was concerned about shooting through these grills. Um, and uh, so I was sort of engaging, the, you know, from the right hand side, um, facing backwards, if you like, to the, uh, the direction of travel. It was very, very, very surreal, you know, um, and then uh, I remember as we got out of the ambush, um, for the first time ever, we'd been issued these personal roll radios. So before it used to be a section commander, you know, the head of an eight man section and a section two IC, um, the head of a sort of four man section. And by this point, everybody had their own radio. And I think that's what saved our lives, the ability to communicate with every single man in the team. Um, and we got out of the, uh, the ambush, checked that everyone was, uh, was there uh, and that we were all right. And then uh, I remember him saying, you know, um, we'll put into this ERV emergency rendezvous. So basically a, a safe lay by, if you like out of the ambush. And that's where we checked that everyone was okay. And um, I remember him saying to me, uh, do you mind if I uh, have a fag boss? And I was about to say, you know, we'll wind down the windows at least because we're not supposed to smoke in military vehicles. And then realized how ridiculously stupid that was. And then uh, I went to wind down the window and decided I was going to smoke at that point as well. Cause it was a bit cheeky, you know, and, um, and then realized there was no window left, you know, they'll be shot to pieces. And, uh, and then um, I could feel this burning in my leg. And um, I looked down and uh, lifted up my, uh, my combat trousers, you know, and saw a little hole in the front of the boots. And then as I peeled the boot forward, saw the bullet just wedged in the, uh, in the front of my shin. And it was only the burning that I could feel. And that's because obviously, you know, you've got adrenaline coursing through your veins that uh, you just, you know, unless it hits a vital organ or something or something really painful, you don't necessarily feel it. So it was just burning. Um, what was funny was that when we got back to the medical center, I um, made sure all the blokes were okay. One of my pals, um, he was a major there in the intelligence corps, but he'd been a, a, an ammunition technical officer at bomb tech. I said, can you go and sit with the blokes and uh, there's a bottle of whiskey in the, uh, in the safe, you know, make sure they have a drink and they can chill out. I'm just going to go down to the med center. And uh, when I got there, there was a, a medic from, from Hereford, from the SAS there. And of course I walked in and, uh, he was sort of busy chatting to people, organising stuff. And he was like, Chris, how's it going? You know, so it was the old sort of, you know, catching up, high fives, you know, what have you been up to? And he was like, anyway, what can I do for you? I was like, oh, I've been shot, you know. And at that point, he sort of threw me on a stretcher and then took me through and, uh, and all these medics came up. But it was absolutely, you know, literally just a flesh wound. Um, and it cauterises, it went in there, you know. So the best sort of granddad wound you could get. But I just remember a real burning sensation and a, a nice little scar nowadays as well to show my grandchildren. God, it's there by the grace of God, isn't it? 100%, yeah. God. Absolutely. Let's talk about a, a reading part of your book earlier, and, and you open up by talking about the weight that you're carrying when you're disposing a bomb, and it's bloody phenom phenomenal. Oh. Chris, yeah. just one, one, one second. Yeah, so the weight of the bomb suit, um, when, you, when you go down and do a, uh, an approach to a device, the, the, the philosophy that we use is remote, semi-remote manual. And what that means is if you can send a robot down there, then you always send a robot down there. Um, if you can't, or even if you set it down there and shot a bomb and you know, potentially neutralized it, you still got to go down manually and confirm it. So we do what's called a semi-remote. Then we put the bomb suit on. We walk down there and we take some, some hooks and lines with us, you know, ropes and attach them to anything that needs to be moved. 
then we go back to the safety of our incident control point and uh, and give them a tug or we'll take another weapon down there and, you know, shoot it if necessary. Um, if we don't have a full what we call disruption. And then the final thing is the, uh, the, the manual. And that's where you go down there in the bomb suit and, uh, you know, do some jiggery pokery with your hands if necessary. Um, the, the exception to that is what we call a category A, which is when there's an imminent threat to life and a probable large scale loss of life. In that case, you dispense with the bomb suit and you dispense with, with you know, a bomb disposal weapon and you'll go down there with your snips and, uh, and basically, you know, take your balls in your hand and, uh, <laughs> and get your gallantry awards afterwards, basically. Um, but you've always got to do a manual approach pretty much after you send the robot down there. And when you do that, you're wearing the bomb disposal suit, which is at least 85 pounds in, uh, in weight. And then you're usually carrying a, uh, a big sort of EOD weapon, a bomb disposal weapon. And it's a, a big sort of like a cannon, if you like, electrically fired that contains a jet of water um, and a, a propulsion charge in the end and a big metal frame as well, because it's got to be really sturdy to be able to position it against the device without it falling over. So you're carrying that as well, you know, and that's uh, tens of kilos as well. And then usually a tool bag with all your bomb disposal tools, because you never really know what you've got until you're down there at the business end. Um, and you do what's called the long walk. You leave the safety of your incident control point with all your team and you go down there because it's always a single man risk and you're carrying all this kit. Now, the good thing about it is, you know, unlike when you're a Royal Marine where you're, uh, you're yomping and you're carrying all this kit on your back in a Bergen, um, the bomb suit is distributed over your entire body. So although it's 85 pounds in weight, it doesn't feel like 85 pounds. Um, you know, the real weight is on your arms when you're like an orangutan when you come back because you've got an extra two inches of, uh, of length on each of them from, from carrying the equipment in your arms. But what is, in, what is very um, difficult and, and constricting about the bomb disposal suit is that nowadays you're operating in, in the Middle East, you know, or, or back then in the Middle East predominantly, and the weather, you know, 52 degrees heat in the midday sun, you know, you're going to overheat in that bomb disposal suit. So... You know, my very first job, I went down with heat exhaustion, you know, day one, week one, schoolboy era. Um, the worst thing about it was waking up in the medical centre and getting the humiliation from the team, prodding me and calling me weak, you know, for uh, for going down with heat exhaustion. So after that in Iraq, you know, I think we did 45 tasks. I didn't do a single one in the bomber suit after that. I just wore the same combat body armour that every other um, serviceman and woman wore out in Iraq at the time. Um, and you just, you know, it's all about calculating risk, mitigating risk. You know, there's no point in uh, um, wearing a big bomb suit if you're going to fall unconscious on the bomb and blow yourself to pieces anyway, you know. So you try and do the common sense thing. What precautions do you take then in case the device itself is a decoy and there's a device next to it or, 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 or what I guess you call that a secondary device? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, the, uh, you know, the terrorist tactic is, is quite often um, they'll put a main charge and they'll put a secondary charge where they think you're going to start your team, you know, your, your control point, if you like. And quite often there'll be dummy charges, decoy charges, you know, elaborate hoaxes, we call them. And there'll be a, uh, you know, a, well, a come on, basically. And there'll be a, uh, a second charge around there or even a tertiary charge as well. So um, bomb disposal is all about your threat assessment. You've got to think like a, uh, a terrorist and, you know, you do these rapid fire questions, you know, almost like an interrogator does. Um, and you're asking people, you know, what is it? Where is it? When was it laid? When was it found? When was the area secured? What else was seen and heard there? Is there any evidence of ground sign? You know, all sorts of a whole raft of questions. And as you're doing this, of course, you have experience. You're used to this anyway, like any other form of military uh, service or activity. But you're continually building up and refining your threat assessment in your head. I guess what makes it different to other tasks in the military is that you can never have a hundred percent plan. You know, every single step you take towards that bomb, you're continually refining your plan as you're becoming more attuned to the environment. You know, you might see a bit of ground sign disturbance of the earth. You might see a component in the ground that reminds you of another device that you saw some time back um, where, you know, that was, you know, multi switch device or whatever it could be. So, you know, you can't just sit in the control point and say, well, I'm not going to do this because I don't have all the information to make a plan. Um, nor can you just go forward, you know, with a blank canvas and say, I'm just going to wig it. Um, you have to make the best plan you can, but you know, it's that decision action cycle. You've still got to go and commit 
and you've got to go and uh, face the task in hand. But you're continually refining it all the way along there. And, and what's interesting is, you know, it's never over until you've done that final cut of the wire, remove the detonator out of the circuit and, uh, and giving it a good hook and line to make sure there's nothing else cheeky underneath there, you know. And it's quite interesting because once you've done that, it's not a particularly physical activity, but it's like you've run a marathon at the end of it, you know, because that mental um, exertion coupled with the physical exertion, coupled with the environment, the heat and all that sort of stuff, you know, it really is, you know, by the end of the day, you're just like absolutely whacked mm. and, uh, you know, ready for a brew and a cigarette and getting your head down. Do many operators get sniped at while they're dif- trying to defuse a bomb? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, um, we got sniped at um, in the incident control point. Um, I always used to carry a firearm down with me from Iraq onwards, basically. Um, certainly one of my colleagues, um, probably the least, I'm not going to say his name in case he watched it, but one of the least military um, ATOs, he was a warrant officer you could ever imagine, you know, um, a uh, fertility challenged little dumpy chap, you know, um, and uh, he was down in a, um, at the business end, manually neutralising the device and came under sniper fire. And apparently a, a warrior armoured vehicle came down and uh, he jumped in the back and he was putting rounds down range right, shooting at the terrorists from the back of this warrior as they were driving away, you know, and, and got a gallantry medal for it as well. Literally the least military combat type bloke you'd ever imagine. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was never sniped at specifically, you know, not, not close um, contact. There's always rounds in the area um, and there's certainly usually um, indirect fire as well, mortar or a, a rocket fire. Um, it's never usually that accurate, but of course, you know, you can't stay there forever. You know, the longer you stay there, then there's going to be some form of counterattack and you're going to be targeted because there's only a, a finite number of bomb makers, these highly skilled, you know, ingenious psychopaths with the requisite level of skill set, ability, knowledge to design and manufacture these devices on, on, on mass scales, you know. Um, and in the same way, there's only a, you know, a comparatively small number of trained bomb technicians who can go in there and, and, and counter that threat, if you like. So and also we, we, you know, we do the bomb scene investigation as well. We get the forensics, the DNA, build up that picture, what we call the bomb maker's signature, and then feed that into the law enforcement or to our, uh, you know, intelligence community. They put together target impacts. And they usually catch these guys, you know, so they don't like us very much. So we quite often become targets as well. So one way or the other, whether you're ambushed on the way to a job, on the way back from a job, or it's sniper or indirect fire, um, you know, you, you've got to keep your wits about you for sure. When they're doing the forensics, are they, I, I guess there must be so many things they're trying to ascertain what, who made the bomb, where it was made, are they going to be more like this made, but then also... I guess the factor is who's 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 paid for it. You know, has it come from another? I don't want to say any names <laughs> of countries because I don't want to unfairly um, yeah, name someone. But you know, there's. I mean, it, um, well, I mean, Sweden is one of the biggest arms traders in the world, aren't they? France is, and, and well, and obviously Great Britain. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, for conventional weapons, absolutely. Um, Improvised explosive devices, they either use modified conventional munitions, so, you know, the, the general arms trade that you talk about, or there'll be off-the-shelf electronic components and everyday items that are basically, you know, improvised, built in a fashion that turn them into lethal weapons of war. And absolutely, I mean, what we did, we, we look for forensics, DNA, biometrics, to identify who the bomb maker is, because there's only a few, few of these people that do it. But in addition to that, we want to find out where the components come from. Is there, you know... Um, a, uh, you know, is it state-sponsored terrorism? Is there, you know, one of the axes of evil countries providing the uh, the components? And we've certainly found that in many cases as well. So, um, you know, you want to know not just how it's made and who made it, but you want to know what it actually does, how many more have been made, um, and how to protect against it for the force protection, if you like, of, you know, your own law enforcement, military and the civilians on the ground as well. And of course, you want to be able to almost reverse engineer it so that you can get the information out to the other bomb technicians on the ground and the other search teams on the ground so that they know how to find it and how to neutralize it safely. Um, because invariably, you know, these things become more and more technology advanced 
not less and less. So, uh, you know, you may be lucky um, or incredibly gifted at one aspect of it and be able to, you know, overmatch it, you know, neutralize it, render it safe, disarm it. Um, whereas the next person may not have all the information and it may just, you know, be the difference between that person living or dying if you can get the information to them. How do you record all that information? Is that is that computerized? Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, good old fashioned notebook and pen when you're on the ground, um, photographs. And then, of course, like any other aspect of, uh, you know, military activity, um, you've got to go back and then do the report writing. And, you know, there'll be weapons intelligence reports that go out to the entire community, you know, every military unit on the ground, intelligence organisation on the ground and, uh, you know, around the world in many cases. And then there'll be the technical report, which goes out to the bomb technicians. Um, and that talks about your actual render safe procedure as well, which is, is very, very closely guarded because obviously... If the bad guys knew exactly what procedures were used, you know, every single one is recorded, um, then uh, they would know how to potentially, you know, um, target us in a very sort of cunning way. So when we fill out those reports, it's always encoded as well. We use special codes um, to, uh, you know, to basically correspond with each um, procedure that we use just in case it was to, you know, fall into the wrong hands. Um, yeah. So that's the way it's done. Do you ever get, I don't know if I've watched too many films here, but do do the bomb makers ever leave their signature in it? it it's <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry, Chris. When it comes to the bomb maker's signature, um, it's a sort of metaphorical word that we use, really. You know, um, what you'll find is that if there was a hundred different ways to configure a certain type of device, a bomb maker would use exactly you know one of those ways every single time. Um, it may be that, you know, there's literally some blood in there, which leaves their, their DNA behind, you know, that's technically a signature, but usually it's the way that it's manufactured. And I remember in, um, in, uh, um, Iraq in 2004, um, they were using these, uh, keyless car entry systems, you know, the little key fobs you use to open and close your car door. And you could go and buy those down in the, uh, the souk in the local market for about $10, you could buy a piece of plastic explosive of a detonator for about a dollar because they used to use them in the locals for fishing. And then um, you could walk about a mile outside any town or village. Um, Saddam Hussein had over 250,000 tonnes of ordnance stockpiled um, because he was expecting an invasion, you know. Um, so you could walk a mile outside any town or village and you would find a stockpile of, of ordnance, you know, artillery shells, mines, that sort of stuff. So the insurgents would literally go and buy a bit of plastic explosive and a detonator, one of these key fobs, um, and uh, and then just walk and find an artillery shell, put the explosive in the end, and they've got a ready ready to go radio controlled IED. But obviously, you have to put certain codes in, and they're encoded. Otherwise, anybody opening their car door would set off all these bombs, you know, by accident. And um, and there was a number of different ways you could wire them. And I remember um, we tracked down a bomb maker, and. Um, I was uh, what we call interrogating. And it's not like the movies, as you, as you know, you know, you don't go in there and do torture and waterboarding and all that sort of stuff. You know, it is an interview and it's done within the rule of law as well, certainly by the British forces, you know. So um, he'd already been tortured by the Iraqi police. So it was like a breath of fresh air when we turned up. And the, uh, the military police from Britain went and spoke to him, you know, bored him to death. He wasn't talking. The intelligence corps guys came in, you know, and he sort of spoke a little bit after they did their Jedi mind tricks. And then I was asked to go in and speak to him. And I decided, you know, I'm just going to speak to him geek to geek here. So um, I told him he was the best bomb maker I'd ever seen in my career. And uh, he was very much, they've got massive egos, these bomb makers as well, unusually. And as soon as I told him he was the best bomb maker, he sang like a canary. And he, uh, he drew a little circuit diagram of the, uh, the, the circuitry, the components. And I could see that this is exactly the same as all the devices that had been used in the north of the city. Because we literally, you know, we, we investigate every single one. So um, I was like, wow, that's amazing. You know, so I knew he was a man in the north of the city. Then I told him that um, actually he wasn't the best. There was a guy in the south of, uh, of Basra who was even better than he was. And this really, you know, offended him and insulted his, uh, his ego so uh, he sang like a canary and told us where this guy in the South lived. So we went and put in a, uh, an arrest operation and, uh, and got the Southern bomb maker as well. All that from, you know, from a circuit diagram. Mm -hmm. And did it go wrong for your team? Often did you suffer fatalities? Uh, I mean, not your, your team, but your, your, 
you know, your unit, I should say. Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly uh, in a in Iraq, uh, sorry, in Afghanistan, like everybody else, um, we got really hit hit really hard early on. Um, we lost numerous operators there. Um, I think we work in teams. You know, it's usually an eight eight man team. I say man is you know man and woman, and it's you'll have a a Royal Signals um, electronic warfare specialist, basically. You know, who's you know does all their sort of magic and jiggery pokery jamming the airwaves for radio control devices and and identifying if there's radio control devices there you've got your infantry escorts as well you know providing that integrity and security for the uh for the team when you're on your ground you've got the, the number two who's basically you know almost a protege he's learning and going through the uh, the ropes to eventually become a, a number one operator and walk down to the bombs himself um He's the guy that sets all the equipment up that you bounce off all the technical ideas and, and information with. And everyone has a vital function. You know, you're a very, very close knit team in this environment. Um, and quite often the guys that come from the infantry to become members of the team, they'll go and volunteer to do the same on subsequent op tours as well. Cause it is, you know, a really, really important function, but you're t- treated like a grown up, you know, it's first name terms usually, um, some of the guys weren't comfortable calling me Chris, so they call me boss, you know, but very, very close knit team. And uh, I remember when I came back from Iraq, I had to go to staff college. Officers have to go and continually do their sort of, you know, their officer education for the next rank up. So I was doing my junior generals um, course. And I remember being told that one of the teams had been hit in, uh, in Iraq. And as it turned out, it was three of the guys that were in my team had come back on another tour with another team you know, whatever it was a year later and uh, they'd been hit by a suicide car bomb and two of them lost both their legs um, and got blown into the uh, the vehicle that they were, you know, the warrior armored vehicle that they were um, packing up. Um, both went on to become Olympians as it happens, Paralympians. And then the other guy, my number two, you know, one of my best friends, he'd been standing between the car bomb and the warrior armored vehicle, right, a meter away from it. And, you know, an absolute miracle. He got blown across the warrior armored vehicle 30 feet into a field behind. And the force of a car bomb is phenomenal. You know, it will drop an entire um, apartment block. And uh, he landed in the field with literally, you know, cuts and cuts and grazes, but no significant damage. Whereas the laws of physics would suggest he would be vaporized in something like that, you know. Um, and interesting, you know, going back to when we were talking about PTSD and that sort of stuff, he ended up getting horrendous PTSD as a result of that you know, because of survivor guilds. Um, so, yeah, I mean, were there any fatalities? There were guys that died. Um, there were those guys that lost both legs um, and uh, and guys that were severely um, affected, you know, by mental trauma. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes it's the guys that survive, you could almost argue, um, are worse off. You know, and I don't mean that to, you know, decry those poor people that have lost loved ones. You know, I don't mean that as a flippant comment. Um, what I mean is those guys that that survive, you know, sometimes, you know, many of them do actually wish they'd uh, they'd lost their lives. Yes, and I think we always have to remember here that not one of our oppos that dies would ever want us to feel bad, would they? You know, it's very 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 true. Yeah, um, and yet we always do. Mm. And and were you a family man when you were doing this? Job yeah, rights. I mean, it's a, it's a good question, actually. I mean, EOD is known as explosive ordnance disposal. And within our profession at the time, EOD was known as everyone's divorced. And uh, yeah, I was married, had a, a two young girls, um, literally, you know, a baby and a, and a toddler. And, um, you know, that's always very, very hard as well. I mean, not only did we eventually end up divorced, um, but um, you're constantly sort of in this in this conflict you know, what makes you a, uh, a better father and husband also makes you a better soldier and a better leader, a better officer, a better NCO, mm-hmm. you know. But it also makes you a worse husband and wife, uh, sorry, you know, husband or wife as well, because what you're doing is you're putting something before your family, you know. And as, as, a, as a serviceman, we're always fighting for a greater good we you know we all know that there's something more important than ourselves and and the team is everything as well isn't it you know um and it's very very hard when you when you've got that inner battle and you're deliberately putting 
someone else before your own family, which which kind of goes against the laws of nature sometimes, you know. But would we do it all again? Then, you know, the answer is yes in a heartbeat, you know. Um, but it's very, very hard, I think, for, for families. And, and, you know, when they stay together, um, you know, it's remarkable. They're amazing, amazing people, the, uh, the partners of those. Yes. When you're in that role on active service, it, I mean, you have to put that stuff out your mind because you can't be distracted, can you? you? I mean, you can't be thinking that your kiddie at the minute's running, you know, running down the road on their way to school while you're no. walking towards a device or you're on, on patrol on the streets of Basra or somewhere. It's, you, you just can't have it. Yeah. God. It's full on, or full off, isn't it? And you've got to be, you know, for the sake of your own team, you've got to be committed to the task. And yeah, exactly right. You just can't have distractions. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, maybe it's you know, when you get back to uh, to your crew room at the end of the day, you know, get back to your digs, then then you sort of have a bit of time to reflect, um, you know, or you make your calls home. Um, which uh, I remember in the Balkans, you know, you used to have to queue up for you know, for hours and hours and hours with your little phone card to get the call home and your phone home and, you know, your missus wasn't home. Um, and nowadays, of course, you know, it's all done uh, online and Skype and, uh, and it's, it's dead easy to do, you know. But um, that was always very, very difficult as well, not being able to, to communicate the silence. We used to have, um, uh, every time there was a contact, especially the kind of on the size that made the news, they they block the phone off for 24 hours, I guess, for intelligence, um, you know, security. And yeah. but I remember chatting to my mum one time. She said, oh, wh- when are you home? I said, um, my birthday plus three days, mum. She went, oh, 24th of September. <laughs> Such a mum thing to do, yeah. Uh, Mother did the same. Love it, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, well, we did. We went out on patrol one time and we, we stopped a player probably, probably up in the Ardoin and and I was with with Jock and um, and I, I do remember just slipping into conversation. Well... We'll be out of here in three weeks' time, and then you fuckers can do what you want. It's something along those lines. But of course, yeah, we yeah. were leaving the next day. It was just because everything, you know, everything, yeah, everything, yeah, everything was from the IRA was passed back to their um, high yeah. hierarchy, obviously. And you never know; I might save someone's life there. <laughs> I might, I might have saved a few. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. They were very, very good at what they did. And uh, yeah, God forbid it ever kicks off again there, really. Oh, gosh. I'm just all for peace these days, Chris. It's um, yeah, same here, mate. It, it's silly. We're all one humanity and to keep. Uh, let, let's talk about writing, because that's uh, a massive achievement in its in itself it's not it, it's something i think many people want to do is write a book and um it's another thing to actually see it through and, and write one how how did that your writing career come about i think basically um well it started off you know um <laughs> as soon as i became an officer writing reports um then i worked in intelligence for a bit and uh, wrote a lot of reports but they had to actually you know be interesting and uh, and informative because, you know, you've got to basically tell it as it is and put it into context. Um, and then also, you know, they say we've all got a story, don't they? You know, and um, my story had been, you know, no more or less remarkable than, than the next person. You know, when I went to, uh, to Iraq in 2004, um, it was it was rock and roll. I'd been, you know, tested as a bomb tech in the most technically advanced bomb disposal arena, if you like, at the time. Um, I'd been tested as an officer leading, you know, the best fighting men on the uh, the planet um, in a conflict zone. And on a personal level, I was tested as a soldier, you know, my first proper time in uh, in combat um, during the ambush. I'd, I'd been in the Balkans, you know, on the receiving end of, of sniper fire. And, you know, as we all had indirect fire, mortars and rockets and stuff. But that was my first time in combat. So for me, you know, 
being tested as a bomb tech, as an officer, uh, you know, as a leader and, and as a soldier, um, that was, you know, it, it was that sort of pinnacle moment for me, if you like, on a, on a personal level. Um, and uh, I just thought it, it would make an interesting story. And then like most other people never did anything about it. And then uh, when I was in, um, in London doing an intelligence job at the end of my career, um, I uh, contacted a, a very famous um, a literary agent and I'd sent, a, you know, you're supposed to send three sample chapters to, uh, to agents. You never send it direct to a publisher because it just gets thrown in the bin and um, sent it to a few and they read it and they came back and said, it's not really our genre. You know, we're not really into this sort of thing. Um, and I got so fed up with the rejection. I'd only sent it to three people, which, you know, by the way, for the budding authors out there, you know, expect to be re rejected hundreds of times, but, you know, don't give up. Um, but I got so, so sort of fed up with this, you know, that I am, um, I sent a one page synopsis to, uh, to this, you know, quite famous literary agent, Mark Lucas, um, who's, uh, you know, had a lot of military authors and uh, wasn't expecting any response. And then got a phone call from him saying, um, I want to talk a bit more. And then we went and met for lunch and uh, he said, right, I think it's an interesting story. I want you to write it, what they call a proposal, you know, which is sort of sample chapters with a, you know, a few lines explaining what happens in between those chapters, you know. And uh, he said, you can write, but you need to write, you need to learn to write like a writer. So he just gave me some some tips and, uh, you know, I listened to what he had to say, um, played around with it and then, you know, eventually got the book off the ground and then, uh, and then wrote another one, um, which I'd obviously, you know, learned the first time around. So, yeah, it was really good. It was good to... um you know, learn from somebody, but, but I wrote the books myself as well, which, you know, some people have, have ghost writers because it's, um, you know, it's better. They could, they could tell their story, but not necessarily put it on the page. Mm. Other people are good at writing, but they don't necessarily have a, have a story to tell. Um, but it's, it's definitely hard work, you know, all the, uh, the, the bombs and bullets and fun and action and all that sort of stuff and craziness. It's definitely one of the hardest things I've ever done for sure. And, and yeah, you'll know all about it as well. You know, Yes, the whole writing journey is fascinating in itself. I I taught myself English in the Marines, having pretty much failed everything at school. Did a correspondence course. And the first um, assignment was right about a so-and-so. And my friend had done the course before me. He went on to he he went back into training to become an officer. So rather than go SD. He left the Royal Marines, and, which you have to do, and then rejoined as an officer. Mm. And he said, Chris, it's just bullshit, mate. English is bullshit. He said, um, instead of writing prisoner sat in his cell, you, you write that the, the, the incarcerated man sat there in the gloom. <laughs> Rays of right. Ray, uh, beams of sunshine shot yeah. through the bars of his solitary confinement, ricocheting around the cell and filling his his heart with freedom and his life with. Lo and I'm like, oh, it's bullshit. And he said, yes, no so, problem. <laughs> so I sent this assignment off with with that philosophy in my mind, and it just came back. Chris, your English is excellent. Don't <laughs> wait. A, don't wait a year. Take the exam next month, and I. I did and got my English GCSE as it was then. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, you know, and it, it's, it's like anything, isn't it? It's, it? You know, people always make things out to be more difficult than they are, I, I find, you know. But when you actually go and do it, um, you either, you know, I, I believe we're, we are honestly the best, most honest critics of ourselves. You know, when somebody, you know, blows smoke up your ass and tells you you're fantastic, um, you, you know that you're not fantastic, you know, um, you, we know what we are. When someone criticises you and makes an unfair judgment, then equally, you know, it doesn't matter how big, strong and tough we are, we're still all sensitive, aren't we, you know? And when there's that injustice, then, then we feel that as well, you know? But when it comes to our abilities, I think, you know, people always make things out to be a lot more difficult. And when you actually start that journey, that, that classic, you know, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. Actually, each of those steps takes you that, you know, closer to that that um, completion, doesn't it? And I think writing is exactly the same. And uh, I think you're absolutely right as well, yeah, about the uh, the use of English and the bullshit. Yeah, I got myself, Chris, to the point where 
I'm completely self-taught and having a GCSE in English really doesn't mean anything when you start writing a book. But I got myself to the point where I didn't want to send off to a publisher something that I, w I hadn't done every single thing I could on. So through that process, and it was a lot of search engines. I mean, I didn't even know what a comma did. And it's for people listening, I'm not being thick. It's what they teach you at school about a comma is when you breathe. Yeah. L loosely, but, but really a comma, there's, I think, was it five rules for a comma? And there's different kinds of commas. And, and when you get clever, you know when you can actually just delete the commas, which is kind of where my writing is now. Yeah. But through that process, I got to the point where I just, I can edit all my books now. Um, certainly there might be a few typos in at the end, but certainly to the point where they're, they're passable, passable reads. That's, that's amazing. I, I find actually reading out aloud as well. Because when you read it out aloud, you realise, you know, where you need that comma or, uh, you know, whatever it might be. Um, or you realise that it just, you know, it's too waffly. It just doesn't make sense. You know, it's not not captivating. I'm too lazy, Chris. I, I <laughs> it, It's like an effort to read some. I'm just, yeah. Um, it's funny, though, again, because a, a lot of Marines write books. Uh, a, lot, a lot of service men and women write books now, and, and many of them were, were not officers. But back when I was served, I mean, I can give an example. One, one of my buddy's officer mates, he, uh, he was coming back from, um, oh, there was a draft. It was in the middle of the I mean, Pacific Ocean or so, uh, somewhere. And he had a few, few Marine, Diego Garcia. Diego Garcia, yeah, yeah. I think it's Pacific. It might not be, but then it, but yeah, anyway. It is, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, Somehow he made his way to India instead of coming straight back to Blighty. He bought um, an Enfield bullet or, or, or an Enfield rifle, rather, at an auction in Delhi and then burned it back to, <laughs> to England across the, 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 the deserts. Um, Legend. And he wrote this story and he said, he said, of course, there are many types of rifles. Some that fire, some that misfire, uh, some that misfire, and some that don't fire at all. <laughs> Unfortunately, I had bought the latter. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember, um, funnily enough, he wrote this piece for the Globe and Laurels for the Marines magazine. He wrote it, it was so incredibly funny. Um, and but the guy who edited it was one of my Marine mates, so he was just a you know. A, a, corporal or whatever and he he had the skills to edit this piece but i think then um i missed out on all this knowledge i i didn't really know how to write i wasn't clever i didn't know the um famous people from history or philosophy or sociology or all this sort of stuff that people that have been through uni just seem to know yeah <laughs> yeah i know what you're saying yeah well, what I would say, though, if I could just interrupt you there, because for your viewers, you know, and you're doing yourself a disservice and you're being humble. The, uh, for, for the benefit of your viewers, the Royal Marines are known as the thinking man's infantry. And I guess, you know, the difference between officers and other ranks is usually only that they've been to university in most cases. OK, that, that's probably the only difference. It's not about intelligence and the Royal Marines are known as the thinking man's infantry and across the armed forces, you know, I, I was, I was another rank. I was an enlisted soldier. I was a Lance Corporal. You know, there's a lot of very, very, very intelligent soldiers, sailors and uh, airmen. And, you know, um, I think to, to, to say you weren't very bright is probably a, a massive disservice. And that's you being very humble because you can't be a Royal Marine and not be very bright. Um, but of course, you know, the education is a different side of it, isn't it? You know, many of us missed out on education. Yes, as a Royal Marine, I prefer to think of myself as the thinking woman's James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Whatever. The, the, other thing I, the other thing I did, Chris, I, I, I realised how many people were trying to get publishing deals and I could see that most of the work was just thrown in the bin, not always because of its merit, but often just because 
I think some intern sitting in an office who's 21 years or 22 years old just come out. How, how are they going to recognise the beauty in a piece or, or the value in a piece of work? They they haven't got the mental anchors from experience to go bloody hell. Yeah. So I I did it the other way. I started approaching authors, published authors, and saying, "Hey, would you?" be kind enough to read a page of my book. I only asked them to do a page because I knew any more, they're just going to think it's a workload. And um, I think the fourth one, I, the first couple I approached really gave me brilliant feedback that helped me shape my author's mind. Um, biggest thing in writing is less is more. And, and that's really hard to understand until you, you, you start to see it. But the fourth guy, um, didn't get back to me for months because he was traveling in India. And when he got back to me, he said, Chris, I spoke to my publisher already. He's going to call you. And I'm like, yes. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, I always look for the back door, Chris, you know, I just, <laughs> you've got to find know, a just, way. The response though is something, isn't it? You know, when you've, uh, when you've had that breakthrough, even if it doesn't come good, you know, I think, and, you know, you, you were giving the examples there, um, you know, less is more, certainly. And I think the other one is, you know, show me, don't just tell me. That's uh, that's really, really important as well. And, you know, I, I remember talking to my um, my agent's assistant and she said, because he is quite, you know, a famous guy. And she said he receives over a thousand manuscripts a month from budding authors and he reads three pages at random. So. You know, I thought if I'd have known that at the time, I would never have submitted a, a manuscript to him, you know. And I think, you know, your point there that you, you brought up, Chris, about absolutely check it, check it, check it, you know, go through it again and again, make it as perfect as it physically can be before you submit it. Uh, that, that's well worth doing. Because if he reads that one page where you're having a bad day, then, uh, you know, potentially you've you've lost out on another words, brilliant piece of work. The problem there is that is, is the time. And I was lucky. I'd left a job. I'd left on pretty bad terms. So I was quite angry. And I think they had to pay me off. So I had a bit of money to sort of buffer me for a while. Yeah, yeah. And um, I knuckled down and I focused. To be honest, it was the first time I, I'd ever tried writing without having a drink in my hand, which was the right. And it was, it was like a cup of tea, rolled a cigarette. And I wrote 3,000 words in one day. And I thought, I can do this. I can, and, and that was it. I, the trip thing had been lit, the fuse had been lit, and I was away. But when you hear people say, um, JK Rowling was unemployed when she wrote Harry Potter, I'm like, yes, because you can only be unemployed to write a book. It <laughs> oh, takes yeah. bloody ages and so many hours a day. Yeah, yeah. it's it's really, really, it, it is it is hard. And, uh, you know, my, my agent also says, um, always stick it in a drawer for a couple of weeks before you send it to anybody. And, you know, stick it in a drawer, a couple of weeks, take it out, have another read through it, and then send it off. Um, because you'd always find something to uh, to make it better as well. So, yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, good luck to anybody doing it. It's um it's hard work, but it's also very rewarding, isn't it? And for me, that that catharsis, you know, that ability to uh, to go through my own demons and uh, and confront them and think about them and pick them apart you know it's a massive healing process as well you know even i learned a lot about the sort of the media sort of arts in themselves so when i watch a film now i'm thinking of it from a writer's perspective and i can see the bits in the film where they've stitched together a scene and i can see how cleverly they've d done it that you, yeah. you would you just wouldn't have noticed that before no you do absolutely don't you when you're watching a good movie yeah um, was it it's the narrative thread they call it don't they and uh, yeah I bore my wife all the time now because I'm constantly like oh yeah yeah well they're doing this and you know you're going to see this in a minute or you know that box of oranges is, is you know the, it's on the screen it's yeah. got to be there for a reason you know yes yes gonna waste, they're not going to waste editorial yeah. time you know do you see a, that a sp spade leaning against all he's going to pick it up and hit that guy how do you know yeah. that why else is there a rank <laughs> exactly yeah 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 yes yeah. yes and you're you're Books, Chris, we've got um, Eight Lives Down. It's, uh, or do you want to read? read, read the yeah, there's, I mean, it's, that's very kind of you to give me a chance to promote them. They were done a long time ago. One's called Eight Lives Down. Yeah. 
Um, and uh, the other one's called Extreme Risk. So uh, Eight Lives Down was very much about that story in, uh, in Iraq that uh, we've talked about during this uh, conversation. And Extreme Risk was, uh, was a bit before, you know, and, uh, and, and then life afterwards um, till I came out and then went and, uh, went and decided to become an adventurer and uh, go out to Afghanistan and carry on working in war zones. And we'll put links, we'll put links to your book below the podcast. I suggest everybody, um, I can just, I, I can tell from our conversation, they're going to be a riveting read. So get stuck in folks. That's what's kind of the, opinion. what's the future going to hold for you then, Chris? Well, I'm, um, I'm going back out to Iraq um, in three days time. Um, I'm working for a, an NGO out there, a Swiss charity. Um, so ISIS or Daesh, they've uh, littered the Middle East with millions of uh, improvised explosive devices. Um, there are refugee camps with tens of thousands of people in them because they can't go into their homes because they're littered with booby traps and IEDs. And there are loads of farmers who can't farm and provide for the populations because their farms are littered with IEDs. So I'm going out to Iraq to work with a charity out there um, uh, with uh, many sort of uh, Western bomb technicians, all left the armed forces, and uh, we're pitting our wits against the ISIS and Daesh devices and giving the, uh, the people in the refugee camps a chance to get back into their homes and, uh, and the farmers a, a chance to get back onto their land. So um, I was out in... Libya last year, Syria the year before that, um, and I'm going back to Iraq now to, to work with some great friends out there. Do you do you get all the same equipment? Because obviously you need all the same equipment. Sadly, we don't. It's uh, you know the charity sector doesn't have the the money, the funding, so you don't have robots and things like that. But what we have is very very highly experienced operators. You know, all of us with twenty plus years of experience now, and the uh, the local national um, searches that we have are amazing. You know, in, in some cases, some of them even former enemies that we've now become friends and, uh, and have a you know, combined, unified um, mission um, and, uh, and a shared understanding as well. You know, um, enemies becoming friends uh, and it's great. You know, it's uh, one of the most enjoyable, rewarding, gratifying jobs I've ever done. And uh, yeah, can't wait to get back out there. Yeah. Well, please be careful. Oh, that's kind. Thank you, mate. I will yeah. for sure. Chris, stay on the line so I can thank you properly, but massive, massive thank you. Well, fascinating story. I'm, I'm just honoured because if you'd asked me two years ago, would I be sat here talking to a bomb disposal expert? <laughs> you know, I'll probably be writing some boring, boring book. I'm very happy you, you, you shouldn't be. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely likewise, mate. It's reciprocated. Um, it's an absolute delight to uh, to chat with you, and uh, yeah, and a massive yeah. honour to be invited onto your show, mate. So, oh, oh, the honour's all ours, and 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 please come back and tell us how you get on over there. Definitely I'd be delighted to. Brilliant, friends at home. Massive love to you all as always. Um, I think from what we've heard, makes us all uh, appreciate the safety in our own lives, doesn't it? And um, and what we've all got to to live for we're not getting our our legs blown off in some village in afghanistan or something uh, if you could like and subscribe that would really be very kind of you and we'll see you next time